Good afternoon and welcome to Artifact Live with me, Scott MacArthur, where we look at the art and science of storytelling. Well, thanks once again for tuning in. Uh, it was a, a good week last week. We had had my first tune in from Brazil last week, which was terrific. So it's lovely to see, and I hope you're there again this week, either live or on replay. Uh, it, was, it was nice to see the, the tentacles of the show going out across the world. Well, let's just remember what we did last week. If you weren't with us, well, you missed a cracker. We we focused on society and storytelling, and I had uh, Tom Morley with me, the the, the drummer, team builder, and member of uh, Scrutability uh, all those years ago. I, I only just remember Scrutability. He's older than me. But, uh, but Tom was great. He's always good value. But what I particularly liked was when he tried to show us how you can use music or rhythm to demonstrate words or demonstrate emotions and I thought that was really interesting and it, it's got me thinking about some future shows that I've uh, got coming up with other musicians. Um, so yeah, it was a good show. I really, really enjoyed it. In terms of what's been happening this week, well, story's been everywhere, hasn't it? There's a lot going on. Uh, we've unfortunately got another a COVID issue on the horizon by the looks of things. So I wonder if the government will deal with it in a different way because as I've said before, bombarding people with these facts and figures, oh, they're very important, but it's the stories that are going to help people change their behaviour. So let's hope we see a bit more in terms of storytelling this time around than we did last time because it didn't work as well as it should have done. So this week, well, I hope you like the title this week. I think it's a really interesting title. I'm going to flash it up again. Um, storytelling in war or war and storytelling. Gosh, when I was talking to Joe about this, we couldn't, we, we weren't sure about what to call the show, but we're talking about calling it conflict in storytelling or something else. And then Joe said, look, I, I like war and storytelling. And you know what? So do I. So I don't like war, uh, but I like the two things together because Joe's work is about using storytelling to try and help heal some of the terrible wounds that have happened during conflict uh, in the world. So let me just get Joe right on right now. Here we are, Joe. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> Welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm fantastic. I'm oh. really happy to be with you today. Excellent. That's, that's a good start. <laughs> uh, I had I once had a guest who had had a, a big problem at work and he said, I'm pleased to be here because <laughs> he was obviously stressed about something else. So thanks for coming on, Joe. It's an absolute pleasure. And uh, tell me about the title. We, 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 you know, it's, it's such an unusual and powerful title for our show this week. Where did that all come from? How did you get to that particular focus for your work? It's very strange. As um, a sort of late, well, probably early teenager, um, I remember seeing horrific um, pictures on my telly of Vietnam and the conflict in Northern Ireland. And I remember just wanting war to stop. It was something that I really cared about. Yes. And I mean, a lot of teenagers have these ideas about wanting to stop things. Mine was yeah. war. Yeah. Um, but then in my 20s, something happened to me, which gave me a direction and focus because I felt the pain of war. My father was killed in a terrorist attack when I was 27. And I remember the shock, the horror, the pain, the devastation, but also the feeling that I, I'm now part of a war. I can feel some of the pain of war. Mm -hmm. because a bomb has gone off um, and it was the, the Brighton bomb, the Grand Hotel. And um, in Brighton, my father was a politician um, and he was killed. And it wasn't just losing my father, who I adored and was very close to, but it was also the me that felt I lived in peacetime. That yes. went away because now I'm part of a war, you know, and so that that was um, decades ago, 84. Yes. And my maths is so bad, but it's a long time. <laughs> and, you know, and ever since then, my focus has been, you know, how can we change the world so yeah. people don't blow each other up? Because mm -hmm. the pain is too great. I wouldn't want anyone else to go through what my family went through. And, and as we know, my, the families have suffered far more than my family have around, around the world. You know, there's yes. so much suffering from from war and violence. Yes. So that's sort of been my focus. Uh, my condolences for that. And and, and I, I, I remember it. I, I was actually in first year at university when that happened. You don't um, look old enough. 
<laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, that's a first on this show. <laughs> but I was, and I remember it being shocking. You know, I, I remember everybody being shocked because during that period, there was quite a lot of political unrest. And, and at that time, I was a, a card-holding member of Militant and Socialist Worker. And None. so you weren't too keen on, on no, Thatcher. Mm. Yeah, and... Um, but I remember the reality of it hitting us right between the eyes. It was like, oh, and all the politics just disappeared because people were dying. You know, it was it was awful. So I do remember it. But how how did you then, what age were you? You were 14, I think, were you? Or, no, 27. Or 27, sorry. Mm. How, how how did you, what was the journey from, from that terrible day? I mean, obviously you have a, a period of, you know, questioning and mourning, but what happened then that, that, that took you to the the career you have developed? How did that develop? Well, it was only two days later that I made a commitment to not have an enemy and bring something positive out of it right. and turn it around. Um, so very early on, um, right. and I actually travelled to, to Belfast in 85. Right. And in 85, Belfast was a war zone. Yeah. British tanks everywhere, British soldiers. And I gave my first talk, um, it would have been in 85, and to like a thousand people. And these were born again Christians. So Catholics and Protestants who should have been on different sides came together through their faith. And I I gave a talk. I'll never forget it. I was terrified, (laughs) absolutely terrified. But then in those days, I would very easily talk about forgiveness and make it seem quite easy. Um, Some of the more difficult bits came later. Mm-hmm. So the focus was there and going to Belfast and meeting people who could have been my other and hearing their stories. And that's when I realized the power of stories that it rehumanized people. People okay. became human. Mm-hmm. And that that idea of hearing stories was there very early on. And it seemed to me every time I met someone who represented my other and heard their story and saw them as human being, that somehow helped heal me mm-hmm. and, and maybe something greater than me. Um, so it was quite a risky thing to do. <laughs> yeah, it's a really brave thing to do, Joe. Maybe mad. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe. But when you see you, just the, the lines you use, if you forgive me, I'd like to, you, know, you say my other, is that, how? what do you mean by that? What's the well, frame? So it's not, they weren't my other, but, but I represented a side of the conflict. Right. And it was a three-sided conflict in, in Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. the north Mm -hmm. of ireland and so when your i represented i suppose the english establishment my father was a conservative politician Mm -hmm. um so if i'd gone for the the blaming route you know i would have blamed the ira who were catholics who were working class catholics yeah so i was meeting um working class catholics in belfast Mm -hmm. um like i i did keep myself safe sort of you know i wasn't I wasn't sitting down with IRA at that time. I mm-hmm. did meet someone actually very high in Sinn Féin, which is the political wing. Yes. But that was done with great secrecy. Right. But it was all about humanising the other. And right. okay. our newspapers, you probably re- remember at the time, like they completely demonised the IRA. Yes. I mean, it was the words they used were just awful. Mm. And all the time in the 80s and the 90s, the government were actually having secret talks with the IRA. But yeah. the media coverage was we don't speak to terrorists they're evil and and that wasn't going to help me yes. so yes. i had to sort of dig deeper to find the truth gosh i mean i i grew up near glasgow and the at that time uh, and all through i mean i actually had my first birthday in, in ireland as well so I, I had some contact with it as a as a youngster and then throughout my school years there was I mean, it was ridiculous. Um, the, the the hatred between, I mean, you know, pseudo faiths because most of them didn't believe in any any one of the three thousand gods. Never mind the Catholic or the Protestant type. Um, but there was hatred and and, and confusion. And I remember um, once running home to my mum, saying, "Mummy, mummy, the Fenians are coming to get me," and I, and I, and I thought the Fenians were like space monsters. I had no idea. What it was, I had no, I was, I had no clue. But I'd been told, as you've just said, that there was them, and there was us, there was them, and then there was us, and th- those them were 
were, were, were mad, crazy, dangerous, you know. So, yeah, I have some empathy from the from my own experience. And, and fortunately, it's, it's not as bad now as it used to be, certainly not in Glasgow. Um, but can I... So yeah, all well, I'm saying I'm only saying that because I think there's some empathy there for some of that experience sure. I, I did grow up during it. Um, oh, fascinating, yeah. And I, I, but you talk about humanising. Can you just explain what you mean by that? Because I, I think I do understand it, but I, I, I'd like to hear your perspective because I know other people see things in different ways. Joe, can you explain what you mean by humanising through the storytelling? Well, maybe, maybe we can go to the really important conversation I had. Okay. Uh, because that's such an amazing illustration of, of seeing the humanity of someone who mm-hmm. is my other. And um, so back in um, 98, we finally had the Good Friday Agreement. And yeah. part of the agreement was that the people who were in prison for being political prisoners came out of prison. So yeah. Patrick McGee, who planted the bomb, which my father was killed and four others was released. And that's when I decided that I wanted to meet him. And I met people in Northern Ireland who knew him and I knew he was committed to the peace process. So I went to meet him and I just, we just had the anniversary last week, 21 years ago. uh, And I actually had an event with him because I wanted to mark the fact we've had 21 years of dialogue and friendship and trust. But back 21 years ago, you know, I didn't know who he was. He didn't know who I was. I was terrified. And at that time I realized that the people who've been involved in the struggle they did it because they tried non-violence and and hadn't worked. Yes. So for them, violence was a response to how they saw it as mm. the oppression and the suffering in, in their community. Yes. And I knew he'd come with a lot of political righteousness and certainty. Um, so that, you know, I was okay with that because all I really wanted was to look in his eyes and see him as a human being because, you know, he was the most demonized terrorist i use that word because that's the word that was used against him that we had yes and that didn't help me i wanted to see him as a human being like the face behind the label so when he arrived my purpose was to really listen to him and really understand him and and hear his story and ask him Mm -hmm. questions and it wasn't to get an apology um and i remember a point where he's talking about the suffering of his community of what he saw and and I just saw how much he cared you know he he was someone yes he planted that bomb but he also cared for people mm-hmm. and so that brings back the the real person the humanity because it's, people are never just defined by one action or maybe many actions we're all more than what we've done yes and when I saw that humanity he actually um himself had a moment of complete transformation where he stopped talking about the sort of political political justification and started talking about himself and wanted to know about my dad. Right. Because this is another part of conflict. Like when he planted that bomb, he's he only he saw no one in the hotel. They were all demonized. They were legitimate target and means to an end. Yes. And he's now seeing my dad is a human being. So my dad is being humanized through Patrick asking me questions about my dad and realizing that some of the qualities he saw in me must have come from my dad. Yes. So there's, there's rehumanization going on all sides. And, you know, Patrick would later say that he was disarmed by my empathy. And yeah. if I'd gone in there going, I'm right, you're wrong, you're bad, I'm good. Uh, yeah. That, you know, the, the kind of, I, I'm not even going to call it childish because it's not childish. Is what is what we do as adults, isn't it? Yes. Um, right. co- confronting and blaming, he would have stayed mm-hmm. in a very safe place of righteousness. So, so he opened up. That's oh gosh, that first moment when you walked into the room was he in the room or did he walk in? How, he, how, walked, how... he walked in. He walked I was in. in someone's kitchen. This is not a prepared environment. This is just a friend's <laughs> house. Okay, so how, how, that's amazing. Did did your heart miss a beat, or was it? Yeah, I yeah, bet. I was terrified. I can't, I can't relate to it. Yeah, uh, I I have empathy with the with the the Protestant Catholic thing, but I can't relate to that. So, I, I, I absolutely incredible. Uh, and so, did you then go to him, or did he come to you, or how how did it work? Well, I I asked him to meet me, 
Is that right. what you mean? Like, yes. Yeah, it yeah, had yeah. to come from me. He he never would have asked to meet anyone. That had to come right. from me. Okay. Um, and it took a long time because I, I kept on hearing he didn't want to meet me. But then that wasn't true. He always said he would meet me. So it was complicated. Right. And okay. eventually we met. And okay. for, I think for both of us, we knew once was not enough. You know, we started something together and we needed to carry on. Right. And so there was a second meeting and then a third meeting. Right. And then that carried on and it was filmed for a documentary. Was it? Um, really? Yeah. What was that called? Facing the Enemy. Right. Um, it's actually now on Vimeo. It comes on and off Vimeo. I don't understand Vimeo, but it's now on there now and it's free. Um, I can send you the link. That's okay. There's, I've got a note of it. I just had a look at it there. Yes. Okay. okay so it's got my my married name on it, which I wish it didn't. But there we go. <laughs> oh no! Is that the your married name? Is that the right one? Okay. Thank you. Well, I'll put that in the show notes, uh, Joe. If people might be interested to watch it, if you don't mind. It's uh, an, an amazing yeah. film and a portrayal of some of our early meetings and right. some of the struggles we both had. I think. Right. And how how did you then go from those struggles mm. to actually s s and and I'm I'm just giving you my impression of reading your website and things. There's obviously agency in that relationship. You saw something mm -hmm. that you could do with that relationship. Is that what happened, or did, did did things just happen organically, or what happened? It was very organic at the beginning. Right. <clears throat> you know, the first yeah. time you were asked to speak. Um, was an event in London and we had maybe four minutes each <laughs> and that was the time Patrick said I now know I could have sat down and had a cup of tea with Joe's dad now the cup of tea for me is sort of a metaphor of yeah of you know sitting down with respect and dignity and you know and the Conservative government didn't have a policy of cups of tea with terrorists <laughs> mm. or, or or even now you know it's not part of their policies Yes. But that is to me a cup of tea is like a form of non-violence, and I can imagine the two of them sitting together. And and after that, people came up and said, just seeing the two of us together was something they were never going to forget, right? Because we should be enemies, and yet there we were, mm -hmm. trusting each other, speaking, listening with respect, and that had an effect, impact on other people. Mm -hmm. And I think that's when I began to realise that. What whatever was going on with me and Patrick when we shared in public, it was going to be a contribution to a new form of um, post-conflict healing in Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. I mean, at first I just saw it in the context of these islands, mm -hmm. um, but then it, it grew. But, you know, the first couple of years, probably I was just seeing it as this is my contribution to the peace process. Yes. Wow. So yeah. then that took you both uh, outside this country, didn't it? You, you've done... Mm. Uh, could you tell us some of the story, the, the experiences that you've had in, in taking that out with the country? We've had so many now. Right. <laughs> Funny, during during the, the talk last week, um, Patrick said we've spoken together 200 times on different platforms. And I said, it's 400, but we're going to have to dis disagree. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, who knows? Um, yeah. So uh, usually we responded, but there was... Um, a lot of people we knew in Palestine and Israel who we mm -hmm. met in different conferences in different parts of Europe and also in England who yes. were very involved in doing incredible peace building work and very much the rehumanizing each other through storytelling. Yeah. So I got some funding for us to go to Palestine and Israel for like 10 days. And I remember the first time we spoke, it was in part of Jerusalem where um, it's one of the easiest places for Israelis and Palestine, Palestinians to meet. It was like a, a neutral place. And this group was called Combatants for Peace. And when the Palestinians arrived, they'd all had difficulty getting there. You know, they'd been stopped by the Israeli police. They'd it taken them hours. And the Israelis just sort of walked in and it was fine. And I think I realised the, the hugeness, the vastness of the conflict. And I had a thought of, what are we doing here? You know, yes. like, what? how can we give anything to what's happening here and then during the talk they asked us they said can you give us 
your solutions for our conflict <laughs> and both both patrick and i went nope we're, <laughs> we're here to share our story yes. you know and what happened was was that they took our story and had a whole conversation after we'd finished and one of them said to me there's two things i've got from you coming here one is the fact you're here shows that you care and that matters to us and two we're seeing our conflict mirrored back in a different way and that was oh. really powerful and oh gosh and and where is that gone are you still are you still working um there or uh, you know where has where your contribution gone to well i'm in touch of with some of the people they pop up pop up on facebook and say yes. hi how are you you know i i'm aware of the work that's going on there also the palestinian israelis bereaved families meet who are mm -hmm. incredible um mm -hmm. so once i've been to a country i stay in touch with the people that i meet definitely right because they, they feel like family yes wow and what's been the most um i guess complex or difficult environment that you've you've spoken in hmm I didn't correct um, you for that, sorry. <laughs> well, we've had a riot outside our town. Have you? <laughs> hmm. right. Yeah, Where that was in that? Belfast. Right. But actually, um, th actually this, the one that um, I want to talk to you about, about stories, was um, we went to Rwanda. Right. And Rwanda is very, very, very complex. And I remember I was giving – I also do workshops, and I was there with um, – um, amazing woman marina cantacuzino um from the forgiveness project yeah i interviewed her a couple of weeks ago believe it or not oh yeah i think i did yeah. know yeah so we yeah. were doing this workshop together and and there was an amazing woman there with with a baby breastfeeding her baby and she didn't speak any english and i remember the next morning she sat down next to me and and she she looked at me and she put her hand on my leg and right. then she called a translator and said now I know I'm not alone. Gosh. Solidarity. I thought it was just us. And I she just <laughs> beamed. I know. She just beamed at me. You wow. know, and, and what we exchanged then is two two women, two sisters from mm. very different conflicts. And I will would not put mine on the same level as hers. Obviously, yes. you know, uh, mine's one off and I, in some ways I'm very, very lucky when it comes to what people experience from genocide and war. So yes. the worst experiences, I've met many people. But in that moment, we were like together in solidarity uh -huh. and, you know, across race, across barriers, across everything. And, and she shared her story. And that to me is the power of story. So uh -huh. it can give people a sense that they're not alone. There's hope, you know, there are things that they can do. Yes. And when people are on their own with the trauma of war or genocide or terrorism, it can be very overwhelming and very, very, very isolating. Yes, yes. Ah, oh, got you. Really, genuinely gave me goosebumps there. Um, that that's phenomenal. I, I I remember, and it's over there. I can see it from where I'm sitting. Um, when my grandfather was alive, he he fought like many of our grandfathers and grandmothers in the the Second World War. And what happened with him it was that he was on a submarine, a Polish submarine that got sank, and he was one of the three people that survived that particular um, sinking. In fact, they made a film called Operation Crossbow about it because he he was in the Scottish, uh, the, the Scottish, the the, the 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 SAS, but the naval version, the Scot, the the, the boat oh, wow. service, and um, he was then rescued by a German uh, U-boat. And he was a prisoner of war, but the the the, the German uh, soldier who took him out of the water actually gave my grandfather his service medal because they were both dads with four or five kids oh. in working class, you know, one in Berlin, one mm. in Glasgow. You know, they were much more in common than they had apart. You know, and, and that had a massive impact on my grandfather, and he became. You know, a very different man following that. So uh, these stories, you know, I tell you that story because uh, when I heard your story, it generally gave me goosebumps. And I wonder why we don't hear more of these stories because I know they're there. You know, I know 
real people are not politicians, and even politicians are real people. You know, there's a there's a there's a there's a side to it that you do wonder why. And I don't know if you've got a view on this. Why aren't the stories more often told? Mm. Um, because the, was it, you know this phrase, I think it might have been you actually, story healing rather than storytelling. Mm. Uh, when I heard that um, from one of my guests, I was like, oh, Christ, yes, absolutely. Mm. Why are we not hearing more of that? Uh, yeah, I don't know. We need to. You know, I was speaking to someone the last few days who is American concerned about the demonization of of Russians and Chinese and looking at how to stop nuclear bombs and like big stuff. And he was yes. asking me, how can we bring empathy? And, you know, um, and for me, it's all about storytelling. You know, a, a, an enemy is someone whose story we haven't heard. Yes. And I believe we have the capacity to listen and empathize with everyone in the world. And not just that, we need to, you know, we, we need to be able to do that. Mm-hmm. But there's this tendency to make pe- to other people to to blame people and make them the reason yeah. why we're struggling mm-hmm. so maybe if we part that a little bit i want to take the direction away from the i mean i could talk to you all day about this i mean that absolutely fascinating and g- great respect for what you're doing um but in the, the lessons that you've learned in that theater that difficult environment there's lessons in that in it for everybody isn't there i mean we can take mm-hmm. what we've learned and we can say okay in the workplace in politics in mm-hmm. well anywhere really we could apply these these the, the, that experience could do you think i mean i i think yeah. i know the answer to this but yeah have you tried that have you tried taking that learning into different places different theaters yeah yeah. yeah, I've done some work in the business world, in oh, yeah. the corporate world. Um, it, I do a lot of work in schools uh, mm. with young people. Yes. Um, so it's true everywhere. You know, we mm. always have conflict. Mm. And there is the human potential to to demonise each other, to blame when we're hurting. And I, I'm not free of this. You know, when I feel pain, my first yes. thought is, you know, who, who can I blame? <laughs> Yes. But we can change that. Yes. And once we change that reflex, then a whole new world opens up to us. And it does not mean we have to accept people's behavior, mm-hmm. which is negative. But there's a way to challenge it without making them wrong, without demonizing them. Yes. You know, because how do people change? They don't change because someone wags their finger and go, you're, you're, you're bad. No one changes <laughs> that way, do they? Or if they do, yeah. it's only for the moment. <laughs> yes, we seem to see a lot of that in the media just now, don't we? There's an awful lot of um, finger pointing and shaming, and yeah, um, and then self-flagellation, which I find very bizarre. Um, but um, there is a lot of that in the media just now. Mm. So, just yeah. before we go on, I want to ask you about your 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 artifact and your favourite story, etc. But a couple of comments here I just wanted to bring uh, to the fore. Um, mm-hmm. Is one from Gail Gail Robertson, who's Chief Curiosity Officer. There's a job title, Gail. I love it. Uh, uh, so that's uh, a few thanks to <laughs> thanks to Gail. I know who Gail is. Curiosity. Yeah. Uh, like when we're curious, then yeah. it's it, there's a natural wish to understand and and hear the story. Yes. And and I have masses of curiosity, and I I think it's really important. Yes. And um, when yes. we run out of being curious, then you know, we might as well give up. <laughs> it's like, yes. we have to be curious and interested and, and work to try and find those stories. You know, like mm. the appalling catastrophe of of the, the refugees who died last week. You know, oh, they've all oh. got stories. Yes. And people then label them and stop being curious. Mm. And actually, that kind of certainty that we are right and we're not be curious leads to, leads to be able to hurt people. Yes. So curiosity I, is massively important. Absolutely with you. I mean, what, regular listeners and watchers of the show will know that I, I actually see certainty as a, a serious counter uh, yeah. you know, behaviour. If someone is certain, I start mm-hmm. to worry about that person. And I don't know if, how, how you, you know, with, 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 as you get older, I'm less and less and less certain about anything <laughs> nowadays, you know, because I know, I mean, I, I remember in my youth, I mean, I was convinced that I was right, you know, and I, 
and I would I would um, struggle with um, anyone who didn't see the world through my lens, and I now realise what a plonker I was. Um, um, but I still think that we have to help people see that because I mean, there's, it's like my, my dad and my poor dad gets gets this all the time from me on here. I mean, he is still convinced that his little town is the centre of the universe, and it is the centre of his universe. Mm. You know, so it's got the best beer, it's got the best coffee, it's got the best food, it's got the best music. It's got, and I'm like, come on, you know, get out. And it's one of the things I love about travel. You know, you you start to see mm-hmm. the world is very complicated and very interesting and nuanced, and and that being curious is is wonderful. So thanks for that. And funny enough, one of the other comments we've got is from Derek Cheshire, who works in the innovation space. I know Derek. And he's saying, uh, uh, and he he's a big advocate of curiosity as well, uh, Joe. So he's saying, goosebumps galore. Another another brilliant episode. Well, thanks, Derek. Um, I think you can thank my guests for that. Getting the goosebumps. I've had goosebumps as well, so that's quite good. And um, I've got another response here saying, what a powerful interview and a great way to start my day. Thanks, Gail. I, I take it you're on. Uh, you'll be Eastern Standard Time over there, uh, seven thirty in the morning, I think, isn't it? So thanks for getting up so early. Thank you. Yeah. So thank um, you. One of one of the things that that I'd like to move, I'd like to move us to the sort of the, the core of the show, Joe, because I believe that we're obviously very much on the same space, the same place about storytelling, and I'm often asked about you know how do you do it, where do you start? And one of the ideas I had was well let's use artifacts, you know, let's let, let all the things behind me, everything behind me has got a story behind it. I mean I'm doing public speaking online, I'll, or I take these onto the stage and I'll show them it and I'll tell them the story and it. It really helps you because you don't need to remember it if you've got an artifact. It just all comes flooding back to you, doesn't it? So um, what's your artifact? Did you bring something for us to have a look at? Yes. I actually <laughs> you know a picture of my dad. Ah, right. Let's have a look. Because, um, you know, it's because of my love for him and yeah. gratitude for all that he gave me that has led now to a story that is changing people's lives and obviously i would rather my father hadn't been killed yes um because i yeah of course but and i'm the one who's looking out on the top of the swing squashing my poor little sister below she's my twin (laughs) (laughs) anyway so my brother um yeah so i think it's because because I I've been accused of all sorts of things, you know, not loving my father and betraying him. And but going back to um curiosity and and I think Gail also mentioned kindness um yeah. is the way to peace, you know. Uh what I've learned by transforming what's happened to me um is incredible. And I'm actually grateful for the opportunities that, that I have to make a difference. Mm-hmm. You know, and it, and it started just that two days later by mm-hmm. I always see it as like we we kind of have like a a dagger sword in our hand and we want to pierce someone and hurt them and that's revenge but I put it in the ground and said I may have no choice over what happened to me but I have mm-hmm. choice with how I respond and to me that's the first step in choosing to create a different future and changing the story So Mm -hmm. one story is, yes, my father was killed in the most violent way, but I've changed the story. I'm still changing it. But I've met the man and I've empathised with him. We've gone to different parts of the world. I've had the most incredible experiences of the people I've met around the world. I I have so much hope and people go, how can you be so hopeful? It's (laughs) the stories I've heard. People's the human capacity to transform what's happened to them Mm -hmm. um, is just phenomenal. Have you kept those stories? Have you recorded them? Have you written them down? I'm writing my book ah, slowly. Right. <laughs> okay. Because it, it sounds to me like we could have a, a stencil for peace. You know, you could have a something that you could demonstrate to people that, look, this works. This isn't just some, you know, guru-led nonsense. This is a real person with a real experience who's met other people with that realness about them. So. Well, yeah. can, can I ask how your siblings have dealt with you and how you have taken that experience? Have they been similarly affected, or, or is it? Uh, I mean, please don't. You know, I, I'm not. I don't wish to pry. I'm just, you know, how has that developed? Um, 
they've all had a different experience. You know, I think I was the only one who the how it happened, the why was so important to me. You know, for them, they were they were grieving their father. And for me, it was the the big picture. Mm -hmm. And so they haven't haven't felt that. And but they all still speak to me. (laughs) <laughs> and we'll meet up. Right. Okay. okay. So you know, I, I'm I know I'm hard and challenging at times, mm-hmm. but this isn't about for me always being, um, I suppose, liked or appreciated. You know, because this is an experiment. Really, can we change the future? Yes. And I think we can. You know, and I think we do change it through sharing these stories. I mean, the the feedback I get because I so I use my story. I don't share my story. For, because I need to for me, it's where it lands. Yeah. And I'm a facilitator. So I then move into the audience. So if I'm with young people, if I'm with in the business world or in prison or in post conflict in Bosnia, it doesn't matter. There are individuals there who take the story into their own lives yes. because they choose to, not, not because I, I tell them, I don't do five point, this is how you let go and forgive or build empathy. I kind of, facilitate it so it comes from them in a kind of more organic way yes right okay the, there's a i don't know if you know this quote i'll put it on the screen that you know oh. a story a story can act as an empathy engine oh I my love goodness that. isn't that amazing where did you find that <laughs> i wish i'd thought of it I, chris riddell or riddle as we'd call him in scotland he used to be the uk's uh, children's laureate oh. and isn't that absolutely glorious uh, I, when I when I when I heard that, it, it was about when was it? About maybe a year and a half ago, Joe. So I, I'm not I'm not I'm not had it in my back pocket for years, and I heard it, and I I sat there and I went, I've got to do a show. But that, that was actually the motivation behind this show, because mm-hmm. you know I, I I normally talk about the future of work, you know, and science and technology, and and I realised that oh my god, there's maybe something here. And and can I just say you, you've given a, a an exquisite supporting statement for that for that comment, you know, because I could see the empathy for in you, you know, you can, even on this digital world, you know, you sometimes don't, but absolutely gorgeous. I, I really, I really appreciate you sharing that story and that artifact. So, what's your favourite story? What What's the story that you think? Oh, wow! I've got to tell people this or share this. Oh, so many. The one I'm the one I'm going to share was a uh, is actually a 16 year old gal from the Muslim community in the East End of London. Right. And I was um, one of the things I do is these positive change maker courses, and and if if I can get into school, I used to be able to get into schools. I would be there for maybe a few months, go in each week and build up yes. and build up the trust. And this young woman who was exceptionally bright as they all they all were it was a girls school amazing amazing young women um they all shared with me the impact of racism on their lives you know right. and they'd all had experiences they all knew people and they wanted to be heard and i and i did loads and loads of listening and and i, I also said you know as a white person I, what's been done in my name i'm really sorry about that you know that's not yeah. okay so i called it out and Mm-hmm. And after we we got to the point of where they created their their projects, and it wasn't my idea what they were going to do, you know, it was their idea. And in the end, they worked on mental health in their school. Having mm-hmm. started with the wars in the world, they went right back to the schoolroom, mm-hmm. and they did an amazing project. And I sort of supported them in learning the skills that they needed to deliver the project. And mm-hmm. um, and one of these young women, this one I'm thinking, of, she came to me and she said, "This is the first time." that a white person from your age and your background has listened to me and not just listened, but believed in me and knows I have a powerful voice and I'm going to contribute to this world. (laughs) Now, part of me thought, well, that's shocking that it hasn't happened before. And then the other part of me thought, wow, this is something that I I take this so, so seriously that she's trusted me enough to share her inner turmoil um, and, you know, I can't even get the words of the privilege of that. Yes. And I care so much about my young people because through my story, they get seen and heard. I 
don't know how that happens, you know. Mm. And I've had a queue of young black men all waiting to tell me the story of their traumas after my talk. Really? And also, I have, I have the same response also in, in schools which aren't so diverse. Mm. But to to create that trust is something which to me is the most amazing gift. And I, mm. I just, at least me weeping mm. in, a, in a sense of just how miraculous this is, you know. And mm. I can't wait to get back into my schools. I did do a little bit um, in spring, but then, you know, it's difficult. But next yeah. year, I want to get back and run more of these programs of positive mm -hmm. change makers and loads of listening time for them to talk about what the last two years have been like, you know, how they've been impacted. And mm -hmm. the group that I did work with were doing um, projects of resilience and kindness. So it's back to uh, mm -hmm. kindness again. So, and that, that helped them feel better to, to create their own projects. Wow. Well, if there's anything we can do here to help you with that, I'd be 100% willing to help you because I think what you're doing is is quite amazing. And I'm not alone in that because um, just before we talk about how people can get in touch with you, this is uh, from Jo. Uh, right, Jo's one of the regulars on the show. She, she's a wonderful mm -hmm. person. Until now, I was struggling with the negativity of others. Uh, jo, you have provided me with a way of understanding where they are coming from and thoughts on how I deal with them in the future. Wow. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. That's amazing. Well, isn't that lovely? If you'd like a, you know, a, a free one to one to be heard, because it sounds like you're going mm. through a lot, then drop me a line. And is it okay to say next year I'm doing these a very small course online for people who want to go through a process where they end up with their own gifts of transforming whatever they're going through. Um, mm. I'm calling it the gift of conflict. Or if anyone see that you know I can help in any way then you know do do let me know because mm -hmm. for me this is the most it's the most humbling and the most you know amazing work that I think can be done right wow so people can get in touch with you on this website about that sort of training yeah. and that sort of thing and then the, the website that I spent time more time on uh, mm. before this interview was your other one which is about building bridges for peace yeah um, that's my charity yeah, terrific website and lots and lots of information there about your experience and, and the things you've done since. Is there anybody else people can get in touch with you if, if, if they want to get in touch with you? I'm on LinkedIn, uh -huh. Instagram, Facebook, Clubhouse. Oh, you're there. <laughs> you're all over it. Great. Well, that, that um, I have to say that has been a, a terrific – that's been 45 minutes already, Joe. That that just flew by. and um, Wow. I would so love to take you back and ask you about your experiences in those 400 talks, you know, and how you went round the world sharing these messages. So maybe one day when you're, you know, you've got a gap between courses, you can come back on because I think you, you're, the work you're doing is extraordinary. And, and I have to say thank you ever so much for, for coming on the show. It's been, it's been a privilege to hear your story, I have to say. Thank you very, very much indeed. Oh, and, um, well, thank, thank you. And and I've I've given a lot more talks than that around the world because yeah. most of what I do is is not with Patrick McGee. I sort of do it on my own. Right, right. So okay. I, I, okay. Um, you know, and I just want to anyone who is listening and and struggling. I really do believe in my new favorite word is serendipity. Yeah. I don't know about what you think about that, but even Love in it. these difficult times, which a lot of us are having, there's it's incredible the miracle of serendipity that can be there if we can, yeah. you know, see it. So yes. I, I've that's you know I've had some hard times and the serendipity has been extraordinary. Uh -huh. And looking back on my life, this journey could not have happened without that element of serendipity. Yes. Yeah. I think the one of my favourite stories, uh, Joe, um, and serendipity definitely is part of it. Was um, and it's quite sentimental, but you remember the old um, uh, Robin Williams film, Dead Poets Society? Oh, yes. You know, and he's talking to the boys about, mm. you know, you need to take the opportunity and everybody knows Carpe Diem now, but I didn't back when I was a student, you know, it was like, wow, you know, and it, yeah. it, it um, I, we've never met. We don't know each other, do we? I mean, this has been a serendipitous experience for me. I don't know about you, yeah. but for me, it's like, oh, God. Totally. <laughs> Thank goodness we met, you know, um, I, goodness. on here. And, um, and I think you're right. 
because um and one of my one of my <laughs> one of the things i really struggle with and people don't believe me but i am really rubbish socially i don't like it i don't like going up to people and saying hello but i force myself to do it because i know that that could be a new relationship that could be a new friendship that could change everything for me you know and it's um and for them you know so uh, yeah, absolutely, one hundred percent. See, there's two words you've used there. There's there's there's, cre- there's curiosity and serendipity. Pfft, what a pairing! What a pairing! <laughs> uh, maybe we need to do a show about luck, Joe. Maybe that's what we need to talk about sometime. Luck. What is luck? Uh, what is it? Yeah. Um, so, well, look. It, it just <laughs> remains, it remains for me to say. Um, Thank you very, very much, and I, I genuinely mean it. And it's it, the the empathy I have for what happened to you, more about the the context. Um, I know what it was like in terms of the creation of these wicked sites. This the, what Tom Morley last week called it. You know, false binaries. Mm. You know, we don't need to be in these binaries, do we? We just don't no. need to put sides. You know, it's not about sides. So, so thanks, no. Joe. <laughs> no, oh, one one last thing. Oh, okay. oh, oh, oh. yeah. Our hearts have the capacity to hold different truths. So we don't yeah. need to take sides. Yeah. But our head's not so good at it, but our hearts can definitely do that. We, we can hear. I, I've empathised with people from all sorts of different sides. Um, I, I work and I do restorative processes, and that's what I've learned to be able to do. We, we can do it. We don't need to. Yes. And if we do take one side, then we're immediately closing down, I believe, serendipity, curiosity, you know, and the only way to combat the growing, you know, hatred and demonization is through love. And love, I think, is sort of empathy and action. Yeah. What a way to finish the show. What a way to finish the show. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you very much, Joe. And I I really do hope that one day you and I can have a glass of wine and a a long, long chat about this because it's been a Ah. pleasure to have you on. Thanks. I love that. I love. I don't live too far from you, so we can do it. Hey. Oh well. Hey. <laughs> Let's hope this Omicron nonsense goes away and we sort it out uh, as quick as we can because uh, it'd be I great agree. to meet you. Great to meet you. Thanks again. Bye bye. Thank See you. Again. Thank you. Well, bye. God, I've never cried on the show, but I'm that far away from it. Uh, it's bringing me all these memories back from my own youth, and uh, I think it proves the the power of story so um remember one of the things i always say on the show at the end is this that you know watch out for stories this week as they could change the world you've just some seen somebody doing that and uh, i think i thought that was marvelous so thanks very much for tuning in folks um next week uh well there might be a change of plans so i'm not going to raise your expectations uh and it's a personal thing so i, I need to just deal with it so i'll sort it next week uh, i'll let you know in in the across the social media platforms, what I'm going to do next week, as soon as I can. Uh, the following week is sorted, but next week I'm still thinking about what we're going to do because it's quite complicated. So thanks very much for tuning in. Uh, I've also got something I wanted to tell you about because somebody asked me on the show um, about, and, and funny, uh, Joe mentioned uh, that she's on different platforms as well. So am I, but I've never really done anything just with voice only. And someone asked me or, or suggested to me that I should be, thinking about doing a voice only show i'm losing my bloody voice right now so it might not work tomorrow but i'm going to do it tomorrow and i'm actually using the the new twitter platform to do it um called spaces i decided to do that rather than the other platforms like clubhouse uh, because i have i I seem to have quite a large audience uh, on on twitter so tomorrow at noon uk time i'm going to be talking about a hero for your journey and this obviously comes from the classic, uh, you know, a hero's journey way of telling story. But one of the things that I've taken great, great help from in my life has been mentors. Some of them have been people I've actually known, but others have been people that I have read about and have watched and studied. And I'm going this one, if Joe's still there, this won't surprise Joe. My favourite um, thinker, in history is a, a, a chap called Carl Sagan. I can't even say his name. My kids are constantly saying, Daddy, say Carl. Carl. I know, I know I can't say it. Scottish accent. So tomorrow on Twitter at 12 o'clock, I'm going to be doing a voice-only show about Sagan. Um, and I'll share some of the reasons why he's one of my heroes on my journey. So I hope some of you might join me for that. But to repeat what I said a minute ago, keep an eye on things this week after the show, because this could be the week that you come up with something that could change the world. 
This has been Artifact Live, the art and science of storytelling with me, Scott MacArthur, and my wonderful guest, Joe Berry. We'll see you sometime soon. Bye-bye.